Shiloh, Chapter 3 I don't sleep more than a couple hours at night. When I do, I dream of Shiloh. When I don't, I'm thinking about him out in the rain all afternoon, head on his paws, watching our door, thinking how I disappointed him, whistling like I meant something that first time, getting him to come to me, and then taking him on back to Judd Travers to be kicked all over again. By five o'clock, when it's growing light, I know pretty much what I have to do. I have to buy that dog from Judd Travers. I don't let my mind go any further, don't dwell on what Judd would want for Shiloh, or even whether he'd sell, especially don't ask myself how I'm supposed to get the money. All I know is that I can think of only one way to get that dog away from Judd, and that's what I'm going to have to do. My bed is the couch in the living room, so when Dad comes in to fix his breakfast, I pull on my jeans and go sit across from him in the kitchen. First, he makes himself a lunch to carry to work. He drives his Jeep to the post office in Sistersville, where he cases mail for around 200 families and delivers it, then comes back to the friendly post office, where he cases mail for 200 more, delivers that too. Route takes him about 85 miles on roads you can hardly get by on in winter. Morning, he says to me as he stuffs a sandwich in a sack and then starts in on his breakfast, which is wheat checks and any fruit he can get from our peach tree. He makes himself coffee and eats the cornbread or biscuits Ma saves for him from our meal the night before. Can you think of a way I could earn myself some money? I ask him with this froggy kind of voice that shows you aren't, ain't woke up yet. Dad takes another bite of cornbread, looks at me for a moment, and then goes on studying his cereal. Says exactly what I figured he'd say. Collect some bottles and take them in for deposit. Pick up some aluminum cans, maybe for the recycling place. I mean real money. Got to have it faster than that. How fast? I try to think. I wish I could earn it in a week, but I know I can't. I have to go out every day for a whole summer collecting cans and bottles to have much of anything at all. A month, maybe? tell him. I'll ask along my mail route, but I don't know many folks with money to spare, he says, which is what I thought. After Dad's gone off, Becky gets up before Ma, and I fix her a bowl of Cheerios, put her sneakers on so she won't stub her toes, and brush the snarls from her hair. I read once in a book about how some kids earn money babysitting. Boy, if I ever got paid even a nickel for every time I'd taken care of Becky and Darlin' too, I'd have a lot of dollars. I do a whole bunch of jobs that other kids, other places, get paid to do, but it would never occur to me to ask for pay. If I asked Dad, he'd say, you live in this house, boy? And when I'd say yes, he'd say, then you do your share like the rest of us, which is why I never asked. More Cheerios, says Becky, and all the while I'm making her breakfast, I'm thinking the best route to take to find aluminum cans. By the time Darlene gets up wearing one of Dad's old t-shirts for her nightgown, I'd figured out how I could double my can count. But when Ma gets up a few minutes later, she takes one look at me and guesses what I'm thinking. You got that dog on your mind, she says, lifting the big iron skillet to the stove top and laying some bacon in it. Thinking don't cost nothing, I tell her. She just gives me a little smile and then sets about making my bacon crisp the way I like it. And we don't say any more about Judd's dog. I must walk five miles that morning and all I find is seven cans and one bottle. When Dad comes home around four, he hasn't found anybody looking for help either, but he says, the Sears Fall catalog come in this afternoon, Marty. You got nothing better to do tomorrow? You could ride my route with me and help deliver them. I say yes to that. No, I won't get nothing more out of it than a soft drink at the gas station, but I like going around in the Jeep, riding over the back roads like Rip and Tuck and Cowhouse Run Road with Dad. And take a bag with me just in case pick up any cans or bottles I might happen to see. That night Dad and I sit out on the porch. Ma's in the swing behind us shelling lima beans for the next day and Becky and Tara Lynn's in the grass catching lightning bugs and putting them in a jar. Dad laughs at the way Becky squeals when she gets a bug in her hand. But seeing those bugs in a jar reminds me of Shiloh all chained up at Judd's. A prisoner shares those bugs. Truth is about everything reminds me of Shiloh. You once get to a dog to look at you the way Shiloh looked at me, and you don't forget it. Got 17, Darlin shouts. Ain't they pretty, Ma? Almost could turn off the electricity and let them light the kitchen, Ma says. You gonna let them go, I ask. Darlin shrugs. They'll die if you keep them in a jar, I tell her. Becky, she comes over and crawls onto my lap. We'll let them go, Marty, she says, and kisses me on the neck. Butterfly kiss, she calls it. 
bats her eyelashes against my skin, feels like moth wings. She laughs and I laugh. Then far off I hear a dog. Leastwise I think it's a dog. Might be a fox cub, but I think Shiloh. You hear that? I asked Dad. Just a hound complaining is all he says. Next morning, Dad gives me a nudge when he comes through the kitchen, and I'm up like a shot. We ride to Sistersville, and I haul all those catalogs out to the Jeep while Dad cases mail. Not everybody gets a catalog, of course, but anyone who places an order with Sears during the year gets one, so there's lots to load up. By a quarter of nine, we're on the route. Dad pulls the Jeep up close to the mailboxes, and I stuff the mail in, turn up the little red flag on the side if there is one. Some folks even wait down at the box, and you feel real bad if you don't have anything for them. Dad knows everybody's name, though, and he always takes time to say a little something. Morning, Bill, he says to an old man whose face lights up like Christmas when we stop. How's the wife doing? About the same, the man says, but this catalog's sure gonna cheer her. And he sets off for his house, mail tucked under his arm. People even leave something in their boxes once in a while for Dad. Mrs. Ellison always leaves a little loaf of banana bread or a cinnamon roll, and Dad saves it to eat with his lunch. After we finish Sistersville, we do the friendly route, but as the Jeep gets up near Shiloh, my heart starts to pound. I'm thinking of closing my eyes tight just in case the dog's around. If I see his eyes looking at me, they'll just drive me crazy. I can hear dogs barking when we're half a mile from Judge Trailer, Travers' trailer. Dogs can pick up the sound of a Jeep that quick. I get Judd's mail ready for him. He hasn't got any catalog coming, but he's got two other magazines that'll probably warm his heart. Guns and ammo and shooting times. Why he don't take a magazine about dogs, I'm thinking. Teach him how to be kind. All the animals is chained when we get to his place, so none's waiting for us at the box. But Judd is. He's got a big old sickle. He's cutting weeds along his side of the road. Morning, Dad says as the Jeep pulls up. Judd straightens his back. His shirt's all soaked with sweat and he wears this brown handkerchief tied to his forehead to keep the sweat from running in his eyes. How you doing, Ray, he says, and comes over to the Jeep with his hand out. I give him his mail, and he even stinks like sweat. I know everybody sweat, and everybody sweat stinks, but it seems to me that Judd's sweat stinks worse than anyone's. Mean sweat. How come you ain't at work, Dad says. You think this ain't work, Judd answers, and then laughs. <laughs> Got me a week of vacation coming. So I take a day now and then. This Friday, I'm going hunting again. Take the dogs up on the ridge and see if I can get me some rabbit. Possum, maybe. Haven't had me possum dinner for some time. Dogs okay? Dad asks, and I know he's asking for me. Lean and mean, says Judd. Keep them half starved and they'll hunt better. Gotta keep them healthy, though, or you won't have them long, Dad says. I know he's saying that for me, too. Lose one, I'll buy another, Judd tells him. I can't help myself. I lean out the window where I can see his face real good. Big round face, whiskers on his cheek, chin where his cheeks and chin where he hasn't shaved his face for five days. Tight little eyes looking down on me beneath his bushy brows. That dog that followed me home the other day, I say, is he okay? He's learning, Judd says. Didn't give him an ounce of supper that night. Just put him in where he could watch the others eat. Teach him not to wander off. Got him back in the shed right now. My stomach hurts for Shiloh. That dog, I say again, what's his name? Judd just laughs and his teeth's dark where the tobacco juice oozes through. And got a name. Never name any of my dogs. Dogs one, two, three, and four is all. When I want them, I whistle. When I don't, I give them a kick. Get, scram, out, and damn it. That's my dog's names. And he laughs, making the fat on his belly shake. I'm so mad, I can't see. I know I should shut my mouth, but it goes on talking. His name's Shiloh, I say. Judd looks down at me and spits sideways, studies me a good long time, and then shrugs as the Jeep moves forward again and along the river.